but I'm thankful for this opportunity to be able to do this. I'm going to read a passage from Acts chapter 12. I want to read the first 11 verses. I've entitled this message, The Components of Conversion. Beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 12, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. James was the first of the twelve apostles to be martyred. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, the time of the Passover, when all the people would be at Jerusalem, the great crowds. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, four groups of four, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. And raised him up, saying, Arise up, quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. He didn't even know whether this was physically taking place. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And this iron gate, miraculously, by the hand and power of God, opened itself to let Peter out. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. I'd like for us to pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in Christ's name and we're so very grateful for the salvation that's in him and we ask in his name that you would cause your gospel to be preached in the power of your spirit and that you'd bless this message to our hearts for your glory and our good. Lord, we confess our sins. We pray for forgiveness and cleansing. Lord, we're so thankful that you're God, that you're in control of everything And we ask for your mercy on this world that your will would be done for the advancement of your gospel as we know it will. We thank you for all your glorious attributes. We thank you for the salvation that's in your son. Now bless us for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. The components of conversion. By conversion, I mean what takes place in our experience when we go from being dead in sins to life in Christ, seeing his glory, trusting him only, loving his person. Now, this is the story of every believer. I know it's a miraculous historical event that took place, and these things literally took place. But in what took place, We're given the biography of the experience of every believer. Now, if you're a believer, you're going to see this is your experience. And if you're an unbeliever, you can see what you are and what the Lord needs to do for you. 
And if you see that, you will ask him to do it for you without question. Now, verse 1, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now, there are three Herods in the New Testament, and all of them are related. And this is the Herod at this time. He was going to vex certain of the church. And the scripture says he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. John was the first of the disciples to lose his life for the cause of Christ. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, Herod saw that it pleased the Jews. The Jews were very happy that he killed James. He proceeded further to take Peter also. You see, he saw that it was politically advantageous to him. And so he was going to get Peter and kill him, thinking he could please the Jews even more. Then were the days of unleavened bread, it was the time of the Passover when all of Jerusalem was so crowded. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth unto the people. Now, sometime before this, Peter had been miraculously delivered from prison. You can read about it in Acts chapter 5. And I'm sure Herod had heard about this, and he wanted to do everything he could to make sure that didn't take place. So he had four groups of soldiers, four each. Two would be chained to him, and the other two keeping the door. I suppose a six-hour shift for each group of four, but he had 16 soldiers watching over Peter to make sure this did not take place. And he wanted to bring him forth to the people at the Passover, right after the Passover, when many people would be there, and many people would be happy about this. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, whatever the Lord does, he moves his people to pray for it. And here the church is praying for Peter at this time. Verse 6, and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Now, I love this side of Peter. Peter knows the next day he's going to be executed. And there he is in prison, both hands chained to a different guard, sleeping soundly knowing he was in the Lord's hand. I will both lay me down to peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only maketh me to dwell in safety. I'm sure Peter thought that as he slept soundly on the night of his execution, knowing that he was in the Lord's hands. And whatever the Lord willed to be done would be done. And Peter was just fine with that. There he lays sleeping. And behold, verse 7, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side. He didn't just general, gently tap him. He smote him on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hand. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? Now, what were the guards doing this time? I don't know. Maybe they were so terrified they couldn't move. But Peter's shackles fell from his hands, and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel. He didn't know if I'm experiencing a vision or if this is actually happening to me physically, he wasn't sure. He thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, this big iron gate between the city walls. And the scripture says, of his own accord, he opened to them. This gate opened of its own accord, made open by the power of God. An unseen hand opened this gate and how do you think Peter felt as he watched that gate open for him to go out? 
which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he now knew this literally took place, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Now I've given the narrative of this event it literally took place, but in this story, we're given a beautiful type of what happens to a sinner when God saves him, what his state is before he is saved, and what the Lord does that brings him out of this state of death to this state of life, the components of conversion. Now, the first thing that I would notice is Peter is asleep in prison bound with two chains. Now this represents the sleep of death that every natural man is in in prison unable to get out bound with two chains. And every man that is dead in sins in the prison, unable to get out, is bound with two chains. Those two chains are the law of God and his own sinful nature. He cannot escape those two chains. Now what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam ate of the fruit. Well, God said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, we know he did not die physically that day, nor did he experience eternal death, the pains of hell that day, but he did die spiritually. He experienced spiritual death. And that spiritual death that he experienced, he no longer had a spirit he no longer had spiritual understanding. That his spirit died. And his sinful nature is what is passed on to all of his descendants. You and I are born into this world spiritually dead. And let me tell you something about that. That completely blows out of the water the idea of free will. You have a will. No doubt. I have a will. And when we act, we do what we want to do. We're not forced. We do what we want to do. We have a will. But that will is controlled by an evil nature. That's the state of all men by nature. The very idea of free will is ludicrous. We're born into this world dead in sins. The will that we have, true, we do what we want to do. A tiger does what it wants to do. If a tiger wanted to eat grass, it could, but it's against its nature. And that is our state. Dead in trespasses and sins. Now, spiritual death speaks of two things. Spiritual depravity, total depravity, and total inability. Now, this is the way you and I are born into this world. Totally depraved, and totally unable. Totally depraved. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, says, The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Now the heart, that represents the whole man. That represents the understanding. That represents the affection. That represents the will. The heart of man is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Somebody says, trust your heart. If you do, you're a fool because the scripture says he that trusts his own heart is a fool. Deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Total depravity. Now, what that means is the way you and I are born into this world, we cannot not sin. Now, did you hear that? We cannot not sin. And all we do 
is sin. Our mind is depraved, our affections are depraved, and our will is depraved. You and I are born into this world evil, deserving hell. Now that's what it means when someone is dead in trespasses and sins. Here Peter lays asleep representing being dead in trespasses and sins, sinners by nature, sinners by choice, and sinners by practice. And if I can't see that about myself, I'm spiritually blind. Because if you have any spiritual light at all, you'll know that this is so concerning you. Now, not only does being dead in sins represent spiritual depravity, total depravity, it also speaks of total inability. The Lord said in John chapter 6, verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Now, did you hear that? It doesn't say no man may come. It says no man can come. Every man lacks the ability to come, and that's his crime. You will not. The reason we cannot is because we will not. The reason we will not is we cannot. This is evil, the fact that we cannot come to Christ. Listen to this scripture. Romans 8, 7 and 8 says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither indeed can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You have to have a spirit. Adam spiritually died. The natural man doesn't have the spirit to discern, to grasp, to understand the things of the Spirit of God. By nature, we cannot come to Christ, <coughs> By nature, we cannot believe, we cannot repent, we cannot love, we cannot do anything that is required of somebody to come to Christ. By nature, we're totally unable. And do not think, O oh man, that inability suspends responsibility. This inability doesn't let us off the hook. Like Peter, we're bound with two chains asleep dead in sins bound with two chains the first chain is God's holy law God's holy law commands the death of the sinner now the law is holy the law is glorious it's a reflection of the glorious holy character of God and every believer will say I delight in the law of God after the inward man but all the law does with us is expose sin. It doesn't give any power to obey. It exposes sin and demands the death of the sinner. And there's not one thing you or I can do, I can do to get out from under the demands of God's holy law. Now, let me give you a hint. If you think you've kept one commandment one time, you're completely ignorant of God's holy law. You have no understanding of God's holy law. The law demands the death of the sinner. And somebody says, God's too strict. No, he's not. The problem's not with God. The problem's with the sinner. And God's law is holy, and he will not bend his law. God said, I will by no means clear the guilty. Now, that's the first shackle that uh, is on the man dead in sins, God's holy law. I love the way the scripture says the strength of sin is the law. And then Paul said, moreover, the law entered that sin might abound, not restrain sin, but it abounds. It shows that there's nothing there but sin. Now, that's the first shackle on a man dead in sins. And the second shackle is he's, I'm bound by my own sinful nature. I can't change my nature. 
Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? How then can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil? You see, the scripture says, because of our nature, there's none righteous. No, not one. If I did it because of my nature, it's sin. It's bad. God saw, Genesis 6, 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now this is the picture we have of Peter and this is the natural man, dead in sins, imprisoned, shackled by two chains, the holy law of God and his own sinful nature and he cannot get out. Now, should he be held responsible if he's in that kind of condition? Can God hold him responsible? A thousand times yes. <laughs> but let's go on reading verse 7. Now here Peter is, dead, shackled by two chains, in a prison that he can't get out of. Verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. Now if I'm brought out of this state, it's because the angel of the Lord the Lord Jesus Christ, by his spirit, God the Holy Spirit, will come upon me. Now, here's the key to conversion. The Lord coming upon you. And what that makes me do is say, Lord, come upon me. Don't leave me to myself. Come upon me. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison. Now the first thing that took place when the angel of the Lord that came upon him was light. What was the first thing that took place in the physical creation? What is the first thing that came? God said, let there be light. That's how the first creation begins and that's how the second creation begins. Light. Light as to the true character of God Light to the true character of man and light to how God saves sinners by Christ Jesus the Lord. There's no salvation, there's no spiritual life apart from light. Now all the light we have is the light of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's our light. You want to know the character of God? Look to that one hanging on the cross. There I see every attribute of God manifest. I see the holiness of God. I see his hatred of sin. I see the fairness of God. He treats all men the same. He's not a respecter of persons. Even when sin is found on his son, he kills him. What respect we have for God. I see the justice of God. He's not going to let sin go unpunished. But I see the love of God that God would give his son for sinners such as we. I see the grace and the mercy of God. I see the wisdom of God in him making a way to be just and honor his holy law and yet justify someone as sinful as me. I see the power of God to put away sins and to make a sinful man just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Every attribute of God is displayed in the cross of Christ. Oh, in the cross of Christ, that's where I have light about myself. There I see what I really am. I don't see what I am by the bad things I do, and I do bad things, and I wish I didn't do them, and I pray for forgiveness and cleansing, and I don't want to sin against God, but I don't get a real look at what I am by the bad things I do. I get a look at what I am by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their man, when left to himself, their Todd, when left to himself, would put to death the Son of God to take his place. The cry of every natural man is we will not have this man reign over us. We see the truth about ourselves in the cross, but oh, how clearly we see in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is light. How God can be just and yet justify somebody that's guilty like me through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, my sin 
God took my sin and placed it in his son who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And what did he do with that sin? He put it away. He made it not to be and he takes the very righteousness of his son and gives it to me. And now the holy law of God looks me over and says there's no fault, there's no sin. He is perfect. And I'm given a nature, a new nature that believes the gospel, a heart that was not there before. Now notice when the angel comes, he smote Peter on the side. He didn't gently nudge him, wake up Peter. He smote him on the side. And in this same chapter, chapter 12, verse 23, let's look at how this uh, word is used. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, speaking of Herod. The angel of the Lord killed him because he didn't give God the glory. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not the glory. And he was eaten of worms. The process of decay was sped up. He was eaten with worms and gave up the ghost. So this thing of smiting is not just gently nudging. Now here's what happens. When, you, when you're given life, you see that you are dead. When the commandment came, Paul said, he said, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I died to all hope of self-salvation. I find out by the light that I am dead in trespasses and sins. I find that I, that I personally am totally depraved and unable it's not just a doctrine I subscribe to. It becomes my reality. I find out this is the truth regarding me. Not just something I believe or something I see in others, but something that I see I am. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 5, five times said, Woe unto them. 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 I can join in with him. Woe to such people who do such things. And then after he saw the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, Woe is unto me. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm undone. Woe is unto me. I'm done. I'm cut off. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, when you're given this light, you leave the position of the Pharisee, thanking God for how good you are, and you take the position of the publican. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. He smote Peter on the side, and he raised him up. This is the same word that's used with, with regard to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Now, when Christ was raised, I was raised up. And then he told me to raise up. Two resurrections here. The resurrection of Christ... Now, here is all my salvation. This is the only thing that satisfies me, that when Christ was raised from the dead, that signified that God was completely satisfied with everything he did. He wouldn't have raised him up if he hadn't have made a complete payment of sins. And now God's law says there's nothing to condemn him for. He raised Christ up, and then he told me to be raised. Raised from the dead. This is spiritual resurrection. This is what the new birth is. A spiritual resurrection. Look at the way he says this. He says in verse 8, And he, the angel said unto him, Gird thy... No, I'm back in verse 7. And he raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. I love this. Quickly. And his chains fell off. Now, when you hear the gospel, you respond quickly. You don't wait for something to happen. This is so important. You don't wait for something to happen. You rise up quickly. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Now, as long as you're dead in sins, 
You're going to be thinking about what all you need to do before you can come to Christ. You're going to need to give up this sin. You're going to, need to, get, you're going to start doing this good thing. You're going to need to get your life straightened out. There's all, there's all kinds of things you need to get taken care of before you can come to Christ. And when you're given life, you come to Christ right now, quickly. Rise up quickly. You don't wait for something to happen. You don't wait for an experience. You know your experience is no good. You don't wait for yourself to get better because you know enough about yourself that there's nothing you can do to be better. You rise up because he told you to rise up and you believe the gospel. And his chains fell off from his hands. Both these chains that held him no longer held him. You see, the law is now satisfied. Christ kept the law perfectly for me and I have a perfect righteousness before God. The righteousness of Jesus Christ the Lord. And the law looks me over right now and says, I find no fault in him. You know, people talk about trying to keep the law. I don't try to keep the law. I've kept it. Because when Jesus Christ kept the law, I kept the law. I have a perfect righteousness before God's law. A perfect obedience. Not simply a, an obedience counted to my charge, but it's me. He is my righteousness before God. That chain has fallen off and the chain of my sinful nature has fallen off. Not in the sense that I no longer have a sinful nature, but I've been given a new nature created in Christ Jesus. A holy nature that now does what it could not do before. I now believe the gospel. I now love the Lord Jesus Christ. I now stay in a state of repentance I now look to Christ only as everything in my salvation. I find myself believing. I find myself repenting. How come? Because if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The songwriter put it this way, Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Fast bound by sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart set free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Verse 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself. What is the believer called upon to do? To gird himself with truth. The truth of the gospel. And girding yourself has to do with being his servant. You are now his servant. Your one and only purpose in life is to serve him. Gird yourself. That's what the master says to his servants. Gird yourself and serve me. And bind on my sandals. Now, he had to have his shoes, and we know what the shoes of the believer is. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, the shoes of let your, let your feet be shod with the preparation, with the readiness is what that means, or the preparedness of the gospel of peace. Now, the only way I can walk through this world, the only way I can be ready is the gospel of peace. That's the only way I can walk to know that my peace has been accomplished by Christ and that all God requires of me, he looks to his son for. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, and that's how you received him, so walk ye in him. And what a comfortable pair of shoes this is. He says, gird yourself, bind on your sandals, and so he did. And he saith unto him, cast thy garment about thee. Be completely covered with this garment. Now, that represents the robe of righteousness, the fine linen, clean and white, the wedding garment, the righteousness of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ covering me so that's all you can see. That's all every believer wants. Oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him when God comes looking for me. This is the only way I want him to see me in his son, having nothing but his righteousness, 
not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faithfulness of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. Cast thy garment about and follow me. Now here is the life of the believer, following the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know this about following. There's only one way you can follow someone is if you keep your eyes on them. You don't look at your feet. You don't look at the side to others. You keep your eyes on him looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That is the life of the believer. That's all I want to do is follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And he went out, verse 9, and followed him. And he was not what it was true, which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. He said, am I even experienced this? I don't know. And when they were past the first and the second ward, these groups of soldiers, they just walked by him. They didn't have anything to say. Could they not see him? I don't know. But they just walked by these two wards of soldiers. And they came under the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. Now what must that have been like? They walked past two guards of soldiers, and they stand before the iron gate, and all of a sudden it opens all by itself with no human help, no human hand. They watch this gate open, and they know who's opening it. This is the Lord doing this. No human help, no human hand. This is the Lord doing this. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him, and when Peter was come to himself, he now knows this is real. This is not just a vision. This is real. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety. I know for sure. I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews now I know of a surety. And let me tell you when you'll have assurance. You will have assurance of your personal salvation when you believe the Lord did it all and it didn't have anything to do with your works. He brought you from this state of death to this state of life and he opened the gate. He did it all. Now, when the Lord said, it is finished, you know what that means? There's nothing left for me to do. The only thing that gives me assurance is that he did it all. You leave me with one thing that I need to do, I have no assurance. I'm afraid I'm not saved. I'm afraid I don't have what it takes. But you tell me that he did it all, that he opened that gate with no help from me, and I'm brought into glory by what he did. Only I have assurance. Now I know of a surety that the Lord is the one who did this. Now here we have in this passage of Scripture, yes, a historical event that's quite miraculous and impressive, but even more so, we have a biography of what every believer experienced. Here we have the components of conversion. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we ask in Christ's name, the name that's above every name, that you would give us life unshackle our arms held by thy law and by our sinful nature. Cause us to be raised with Christ and cause us to be raised spiritually by your spirit. Enable us to put on, gird on the belt of truth and put on our sandals, the gospel of peace and be completely covered with the covering of thy righteousness. Lord, enable us to behold you opening the gate and us coming in by your grace. Lord, enable us to do this for Christ's sake. Bless us for Christ's sake. We give thanks for him. In his name we pray. Amen.